Hello and welcome to Sweet Spot DFS. This is a 2020 review of the Greenbrier, or as it's called, a military tribute at the Greenbrier. Joaquin Neiman is the victor. Uh, congratulations to him. And he was one of the golfers that we we were on. I mean, that's one of the guys that I showcased in the preview video. So hopefully you watched the preview video and you played him. If not, I mean, so be it. Maybe next time you'll learn to watch the video. Um, let's look at the spreadsheet. I have the 2020 recent form spreadsheet up right now. And if you recall in the preview video, if you did watch it, we kind of were looking for golfers that had a poor recent form. Unfortunately for this, I mean, this tournament, we had two weeks off. I mean, this is the start of the 2020 season. With there being two weeks off, it, it limits kind of the poor performances that would boost a recent form and boost as in the opposite way, worsen. Uh, and then it also followed the playoffs, which, okay, so a few of the golfers, not a few, most of the golfers in the, oh, no, 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 Wyndham Championship is not a playoff event. Two golfers were in the playoffs. So really the last five weeks, absolutely nothing for any of these golfers in the top 10. We can go back to the Wyndham, which is kind of a glorified uh, a Corn Ferry Tour event, as well as the Barracuda. Now, the Barracuda is actually a glorified uh, Corn Ferry Tour. Corn Ferry being the minor league uh, tour to the PGA Champ or the PGA. So just if you hadn't heard Corn Ferry before, that's what it is. Uh, so, you know, we didn't have a lot of data that, was provided for a recent form. We couldn't really use it and it didn't really apply. So if you use that when you watch the preview and you're like, you know what, I'm gonna go on that and obviously it didn't work out for you, I apologize. Um, <clears throat> I think I added a disclaimer in there saying, you know, this is the beginning of the, the 2020 season. I'm not sure what to really look for. Of course, we couldn't use last week stats that we typically do. Uh, so it really didn't work out. But also on this page, we can see what uh, the optimal lineup and the salary it took to get to the optimal lineup, as well as the $1 GPP that I played in. Now, I didn't play in a GPP this week. I played in a winner-take-all $1,000 uh, tournament. So that was my highest prize pool and my highest entry fee. I didn't put a lot of money into this, uh, and I didn't get anything back, really. So I like I put in $6, and I won $1.50. Uh, I just wanted, you know, to add a little bit of data to, you know, going well for next year, especially if this remains as the first event of the season. Okay, regard. We'll we'll skip past that. That's, that's kind of details that you may not care about. Uh, but forty six thousand was the optimal lineup. The one dollar uh event that I played in, the winner used all fifty thousand, and this is probably I would say like the eighth event in the last 12 to 14 events where the winner of the GPP used all 50,000 salary. Now pros tell you not to use, typically they tell you to leave some money on the table. Um, and I like doing this, highlighting the fact that you don't have to do that. This guy won that tournament using all 50,000. So do what you want, honestly. You, the likelihood of you winning is actually greater if you used all all of the salary. Now, don't get me wrong. When you look at the the point differential between the optimal lineup and the GPP, you're gonna see there was room for improvement. So the optimal lineup had 689.5 points. The one dollar GPP was 583. So the optimal lineup scored 100 more points than the one dollar GPP winner. Again, it's not a GPP. I'm just gonna name it that. I think the reason that being has a lot to do with this being the first event because we can't really look at recent form. I mean, we can, but it's not really going to say anything. People just had two to five weeks off. So they were working with their coaches, either, you know, decompressing because a lot of these golfers that were at this tournament play in over 75% of the events because typically they have to play that much in order to, uh, remain on tour to qualify to keep playing year after year after year. 
So, you know, I would say, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, oh, uh, yeah, I just think that with, with this being the first event, we didn't have much to think about. Like there was, it was difficult to, uh, to kind of predict what to look for. And it was a really good opportunity to win money. As you can see the again, it was a hundred dollar dis, uh, disparity or a hundred point disparity between the optimal lineup and the winning lineup. Meaning you could have had any players. I mean, let, let's look at these. So golfers that are highlighted in this light blue, those were in the $1 GPP. As you can see, he only has two golfers in the top five, one in seventh, one in 14th. Then we scroll down here, Chapel, um, who shot a 59 on Friday. So obviously that helped with scoring. I think he only had like 80 or 90 some points. And then Russell Henley, who is, you know, a favorite pick of mine as well. Uh, I see Patrick Rogers there as well. Again, another one of my favorite picks for the week. Um, so, you know, and salary allowed you to basically select a lot of these golfers. Uh, you know, 46,000 was the optimal lineup. As you can see, the top six golfers, everyone who finished top three was in the optimal lineup for obvious reasons. But some of these golfers down here, uh, are only like three points behind. Uh, I think there's one that has 100. Okay, so eight points behind. Brian Harmon's the lowest scorer. I think Sebastian had 102 or 101. Uh, Shelton had like 98. Hovland had like 94. So I mean, you could have mixed and matched any of these golfers here, and probably would have won that tournament. Okay, that's enough. Going through the recent form, let's look at the DK page because. One thing that a lot of DFS pros don't do is back up what they talked about in their preview video. Uh, you want to look at stats. You know, people love looking at stats, and none of them really go back and, and actually do the review of it. Um, I like doing that. Uh, so that's what we're going to do. I color coded them by the last year bucket. If you've watched videos in the past, you know what that means. Uh, I'm not going to spend any time just uh, explaining it right now because it's not that big of a deal. It, again, this is the first event of the year. I didn't know what to expect. Um, but new time or new people who didn't golf the week or the year before uh, played pretty decent. And that's that's why they're at ones. Twos, I think, like had a top 10 or top 20 finish. Yeah, top 20 finish. Um, so, yeah. Let's, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is just, you know, we can go column by column and, you know, analyze, see if anything pops off for us for, you know, looking at things for next year. Um, uh, the first thing we're going to look at is, is the starting hole with the tee time included. There are, I think, yeah, there's more morning tee times than there are afternoon tee times in the top 10. So we have um, seven here as opposed to four. Seven tee times in the morning. And that was one of those things that I kind of talked about, uh, especially going through the tee times. I wasn't sure exactly how it was going to play off. I thought it was more important to find golfers who started either on hole one or hole 10. But that it's, it's, a, it's an exact split between the two um, starting holes. It didn't really matter. Um, I actually had a different tone after Thursday because I, I, I knew golfers who started on 10 actually did better than golfers who started on one. But as the whole uh, tournament unfolded, I think maybe for the Thursday, Friday um, scores, it did matter. But then the weekend, you know, if you were kind of lower on the leaderboard, it allowed you to get up higher because usually having a morning tee time is more beneficial on the weekends to move up the leaderboard just because the conditions are typically a bit more tame uh golfers there hasn't been a lot of traffic on the golf course so you're not going to get uh crazy lies the greens are going to be immaculate uh because there hasn't been any uh, ball marks on them or spike marks or anything like that um but i don't have, i really don't have that breakdown for you right now uh not for this tournament at least my thought is just you know 
the the starting holes didn't really matter and i don't remember there being much weather at this tournament so it's it's interesting to see that the morning tea times on thursday matter more than the afternoon tea times. that's all i'm i'm getting at i don't really look at odds uh value is always something fun to look at i know a lot of people like looking at that it, it gives them justification for what golfers to play because that's just the a calculation between salary and, and points per game um, but I don't think that really mattered here. Go ahead and hide this information right here so we can get to the next little pieces here. Uh, course history didn't matter. You know, we had some golfers who've never played here before, uh, as well as golfers who have played pretty poorly. I mean, it was just a mix. Same with recent form. All of this right here, just noise. Don't need to look at it. Bent grass, uh, stats were kind of what i <clears throat> targeted and looking at this it didn't really matter i don't know exactly why this is usually the stat that i go to when i think about which stat you should look at for each tournament um but even the overall stats here richie rorensky uh, nate lashley robbie shelton although only four events under his belt seven for nate lashley are they really uh, events that we can look at or, you know, is it enough data to, to make a, an assumption of how someone's going to do? Of course, Joaquin Neiman, you know what, let's go ahead and filter this also. Okay, so, you know, Joaquin Neiman actually had a pretty good bent grass uh, result, or not so much result, but just he had had decent bent grass stats leading into this tournament and uh, brian Harmon did as well and he the reason okay i was on brian Harmon because of his bent grass stats and the fact that he did so poor last year and having that little uh off season i th i think the off season resets a lot of golfers who are typically pretty consistent who did poorly down the stretch and brian Harmon was definitely one of those golfers i didn't really state that in the preview video i apologize for that uh, and it was more or less me looking afterwards and saying, oh, oh shoot, that's what I should have added, but I didn't. So my apologies. Um, yeah, so I guess in all honesty, a lot of these stats aren't terrible. You know, these 60s are hard to analyze just because there there isn't many uh, events under these guys' belt to to figure that one out. And I'm also trying to uh, candy code or, you know, make the stats look better. Because I obviously, I care about the grass stats. So, uh, actually, if I were to go and get something like this, we can see how some of these golfers did over here in the result. And just going by the top 10 bent percentage, like the, uh, um, the likelihood of them finishing inside the top 10, didn't really do you know, didn't really look that great. Uh, Mark Leishman, how uh, frustrating was that? The withdraw. It just, I played him just for fear of missing out. I played him in four lineups. And those lineups were doing really well. Minus Mark Leishman. <laughs> so that kind of stunk. And it, it stinks wasting a good lineup on a golfer like him. Um, it was definitely one of those pivot lineups from one of my uh, more favorite lineups. You know, you watched me put together some of those lineups and I actually kept those lineups as is. Um, you didn't get to see me fill in the rest of it, but I can tell you some of the good lineups like with Scotty Scheffler and Joaquin Neiman had Mark Leishman on it. So didn't do so well. I, you know, probably made 25 cents on those lineups or something like that. Uh, yeah, but unfortunate. But yeah, uh, overall bent grass stats didn't really matter. Obviously, Joaquin Neiman was second in the field and won it. But the golfers around him, not so great. Really liked uh, Russell and Sungjae. Russell Henley actually had a decent round, and he's a very volatile golfer, so that's something I always keep in mind with him. Um, I think he shot a plus three on the last day. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he shot plus three in the last day. So he vaulted down the leaderboard, but he was definitely like top 20 throughout the entire tournament. Um, that's neither near or there. 
Bo Hosler was the golfer that I was really on. So he finished dead last for golfers who made the cut. And now that I say that, the cut changed this year. If you guys are wondering, it went from top 70 in ties to top 65 in ties. And uh, a few of these golfers here that did miss the cut missed the cut on the number. So they were tied for 68th. I think that's what it was, 68th or 69th, which in last year's cut rules would have meant they would have uh, they would have made the cut, but they didn't this week, which, hey, I kind of like that because then the likelihood of there being a second cut is going to be lower. And, and usually you get like top 80 and you really never get more than 83 golfers per se that make a cut. But the cut rules are top 78 in ties. Well, it's, it's top 70 ties to 78 golfers. Um, so if there's more than 78, they'll have a secondary cut. Well, if there's 65 golfers, and I can't, I'm not sure if the cut rules still stayed at 78 for the second cut. Uh, but I'm sure we won't see many second cuts. And I'm okay with that because the second cuts kind of stink. Um, yeah. Bo Hauser made the made the cut on the number. And then I think he shot plus eight. Or plus six his last round. Uh, I mean, it was very steady for him. I think he shot 69, 69, 69. So one under, two under. No, 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 no. He was four under. So I think he went one under, three under. And then to be four under. I think he only shot one under after that. And then I, I can't really remember. But that's that's essentially what it was. So it was a disappointment. And I'm sorry if you, if you uh, coattailed me on that pick. I played him in nearly 80% of my lineups probably why I didn't win any money or not that much money. Uh, going to the 2019 Bentgrass stats, um, that actually kind of shows a few more golfers. Obviously, Scotty Scheffler and Victor Hovland, those were golfers that I told you you should be playing. Uh, Scotty Scheffler was definitely one of my favorites, and I think they were golfing together, if I recall. Yeah, they were golfing together. They were golfing with Maverick McNeely, if you remember, and Ma Maverick McNeely was one of those golfers that I really liked. So didn't work out for us with, with that, uh, with McNeely, that is. But yeah, you could have went with the 2019 bent grass stats and would have done pretty decent. I mean, Kevin Chappell at one point in time looked really good. Yeah, you could have done a lot of uh, lineups with these golfers here and would have done well. You'd have made some money. All right, let's go ahead, hide all of these stats, and actually look at the swing stats that a lot of people call regular stats, which it is what it is. I just like to be a little difficult. Um, go ahead and go by the result. Um, yeah, you might not actually see what that looked like, but I have their ranking for the field over here. So Joaquin Neiman was fourth in the field TD Green ranking, and this is coming from the 2019 stats, which the PGA didn't update. So I think after this week's tournament, it actually goes back to zero for a lot of players. And then whoever was in this field will be in the PGA stats going forward. So this is actually, I think going forward, this, this will technically be week one, and all, all of whatever their stats were for this tournament will be there. Uh, we won't see stats for like Dustin Johnson or Rory McIlroy because they didn't play. Um, so they'll be fresh going into uh, next their next event. So anyways, th these are from 2019. And, you know, there isn't anything that you can really uh, put a finger on. You know, as we look at each column here, I mean, you've got the bottom percentile here. And Wierenski and Harris English. Also, Hoagie off the tee and Nate Lashley. If we were looking at an approach, you can even do that because Brian Harmon and Wierenski also had poor approach stats. Around the green, there's no one really that great. Putting, no one really that great. Green and reg, no one really that great. Maybe proximity, but even then, you know, uh, you guys can't see the proximity mark. Um, gotta get this on screen for you guys. There we go. So anyways, 
uh, you can't I mean, proximity and, and birdie are better. Like there just there isn't anything you can go off of definitively. I can't remember what uh, one of the DFS pros was talking about. You know, obviously you guys know I dislike saying, oh, the champion from last year was top five in these categories. Let's apply that to who is good in those categories going into this tournament. That to me has no correlation. You cannot tell me without proof there's any correlation. Because there are golfers I, I don't see on the leaderboard that they talk about that are good in those stats. So I get it. Golf is volatile. But I think recent form course history and uh, I'm going to call them grass stats are much more inclined to finding you the right place than what I like to deem uh, swing stats. So I just wanted to show you that. Uh, obviously, it's really nice seeing like someone like Joaquin being fourth in tee to green. That really helps. Uh, if you were on any of these stats, you'd have been like, yep, Joaquin's one of my favorites. I'm going to play him. But then who else would you have played? You know, like tee to green. Ben Ann was your top ranked guy. And then I think Kokrak was one of those golfers that uh, some of the pros were on because he had a hot at finish to the end of the year last year and his, his stats were great. Um, but yeah, just like the, the grass stats, you find a lot of golfers here who missed the cut, who were the top of the field in, the, in those stats. Well, that was just tee to green. I don't see any correlation there. Definitely not off the tee. I mean, Joaquin Neiman, sure, he was up there, but an approach, absolutely nothing besides Nate Lashley and Joaquin and, and maybe Tom Hoagie. But this is just for you guys to look at. You know, when I go through these, you can tell, like, this just gives you an idea that you don't need to put all your weight. I mean, putting was just atrocious. You don't need to put your weight on these swing stats because it's not a good predictor. It isn't a good predictor. I, and if you disagree, I'd love to hear it in the comments. Um, I, I do appreciate constructive criticism. So go ahead and uh, let me know how you feel about that. But with all that being said, uh, I don't have anything else to add. It was a fun tournament, and I'm glad you know I participated in it. Definitely uh, stinks that I didn't win much, but it we obviously could have because it didn't look like anyone really did that well. A lot of a lot of whiffs out there. Uh, yeah. But anyways, thank you for watching, guys. Uh, I'll try to get a preview video out a little bit sooner than Wednesday at midnight. I will try to get it out tomorrow, to be honest with you. Uh, I haven't really started any of the, the data analysis, but hopefully it won't take me too long. But yeah, thank you for watching. Uh, hope you really did well. Good luck next week. Leave a like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff, and I'll see you next week.